There we go. In the, in the, in the 1662 prayer book, there is no emphasis. There is no prayer for the Holy Spirit. And so with the, with the liturgical scholarship that most ancient prayers, not, not all of them, we, we, uh, we have examples without, but, but certainly the overall um, normative pattern is that they have an epiclesis. They have a, a prayer for the Holy Spirit um, on, on the gifts of bread and wine. Um, It can be located at either place. Just personally, as as a priest, I, I really like its positioning here in the Anglican Standard Text, mm. or the words of institution. But because I think there's going to be much greater use of the revised ancient text afterwards is probably going to be more what people are familiar. We'll say more about the epiclesis. So that's one difference. What what I was what I was really fishing for. Is, is the repetitiveness mm. of the Anglican standard text. So things are, um, things tend to be repeated uh, and the sense is, uh, and I don't mean repetitive in a bad way necessarily, um, but it's kind of like uh, the, the, again, prayer of consecration here is where I'm speaking primarily. Uh, it's like, we want you to get this point, people. And in mm. case you missed it, we're going to come back to it again. And in case you missed it twice, we're going to come back a third time um, to it. Mm. And, and, and one of the points that's so important, and this will go to, this really goes down to um, the third question, which we'll get to in a minute, is we want you to understand that, that we are not re-sacrificing Christ. That, that Christ's sacrifice for us, to use the word, is a once offered full, perfect, sufficient sacrifice, oblation, and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. Notice, notice this is like um, um, th this is like using a high speed revolve, uh, high speed rifle almost. You know, boom, 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 boom. Um, they're uh, making the point that that what we are doing is in no sense um, meant to be a re-sacrifice of Christ. And why that's important, of course, is now we're, we're dealing with, um, with 16th century Reformation thinking. Mm -hmm. in, in moving away from the idea of the sacrifice of the mass being a re-sacrifice of Christ, we want you to understand that the priest in no way is a sacrificial priest sacrificing Christ who is present on the altar in, in the bread and the wine. And, and, uh, and so that's, that's not an unimportant, um, that's not an unimportant point to make. It's probably not a lot of people are today, however, um, to, to be completely honest. Um, I, I would, I would be, um, I'd be surprised if a lot of our people think we're sacrificing Christ on the altar as, as priests. Maybe they do. I, I don't know. I have um, <clears throat> maybe people coming from a, from a very traditional Roman Catholic viewpoint may have that. And, and I've had one or two, but, but on, on the whole, our, our people tend to be, uh, tend to be more Protestant in their, their understanding. So that's, that's one of the, one of the major differences in the is just in the language there you pointed out the prayers of the people the i think i said last time the prayers of the people in the anglican standard text it's really um it's really a division up of what was called the the prayer for the whole state of christ church which was prayed by the priest without any kind of responsiveness uh, on on the part of the people and and in in the Anglican standard text now, page 110 and, and on, you do have a response, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Although that may be left out, it says in, in the rubrics, you, you can just pray it. And, and it's called prayers of the people where it was very clear in, in the 28 prayer book and, and the prayer books leading up, this was a prayer of the priest. Um, 
that, that was prayed for the whole state of Christ Church. So, so that's an, another difference that you'll find there. Let me, let me just show you one other little difference. And this is getting in the weeds now. Um, I think I made the point last time, uh, John, that where you have a rubric that says, um, or that kind of the, the subliminal understanding is whatever comes first is the preferred, but we'll let you do the second. <laughs> um, you know, there's, there is, uh, there, there is grace here. So um, mm -hmm. on page, here uh, okay, uh, at the bottom of page 115, right at the bottom, the, the heading, the prayer of consecration, and you notice the rubric beneath it. The people kneel or stand. Okay, so following my logic, what is the preferred posture for the congregation here? Kneel. Kneel. Okay. Now flip over to the renewed ancient text. Uh, you know, I, 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 I was rereading this and looking at the rubrics a couple of days ago, and I noticed this for the first time, which, by the way, you never master everything in the prayer book. Every, every time you look carefully, at, there's new things to learn. So, so don't think that, that I've, I've discovered the last word. Okay, page 132, bottom mm -hmm. of the page, the prayer of consecration. The people stand or kneel. Mm -hmm. so, so you're given the option of both in both services. But, but kind of the subliminal message is, yeah, we really want you to stand here as opposed to we really want you to kneel. Why this is important is because you, you have to exegete your congregation. What are they used to? Um, and, and older, more traditional congregations will kneel at the prayer of consecration. My, my guess is that that cohort is uh, declining. <laughs> so you'll run into that less and less. Newer congregations, younger folk will stand because that's, that's the culture they've been enculturated in and, and, and what you do. Um, I, th I think it's Augustine who says during the season of Easter, we, we, don't, we don't kneel. We don't kneel at the Eucharist. We don't kneel for confession. In fact, we don't have confession. And, and things of, of that during the Easter season, the whole Easter season kind of thing. Um, so, so when you're in a congregation, you exegete kind of what the congregation thinks is normative. If you wanna make a change, again, it's like making any kind of change. And, and I've emphasized this, you can make a lot of changes in the life of churches. Um, if, if you're patient, if, if, you, uh, if you explain your reasons, and if you don't do it with a heavy hand, you can, you know, in several years time, you can change worship culture, leadership culture, and things about that. We're, I was on a meeting with Bishop Keith yesterday, and we we're talking about the process of change in a, in a church. And, and all churches change. I mean, change is not good or bad. Um, change can be bad. It can be good. But if, but if you want to make a change and you feel that this is, this is good for the life of the church and it's, it's not in a wacko direction, um, you, you start with your, with your newcomers. You start with your new member incorporation, with, with how you train new people coming in to the church. And as new people come in and you, you teach them new things, then you can make, uh, then you can make changes, but you can make changes even, even in, in old congregations, if you're patient and if you explain it and if you do it out of love. And, and, uh, and so here, here might be a case. If I were, if uh, in my ideal liturgical setting, I would have the congregation kneel for the prayer of consecration because it's a very powerful, powerful place. However, I discovered at 70, uh, coming up to 72, that now when I kneel, I don't always get up. 
<laughs> the knees don't work the same. And older churches had kneelers. Try kneeling on, on you know, a tile or a, or a concrete floor. It hurts kind of thing. And, and, and so probably the culture of most of our churches, um, particularly our newer people, is to stand at this point. But that's one of the differences. The, the, the Anglican standard text, not just in the Eucharistic prayer, but throughout, expresses a kind of a, a older, uh, more reverential piety. The, 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 the renewed ancient text expresses a more, a more modern, um, joyful piety. Mm -hmm. Both, both have their places. Um, if I were to exegete the culture we're in now, I would say it, it's probably better to think reverential long term, because I think that that's what we're going to need in our church, a greater reverence, not a less reverence. But, but you could use both. And so in, in, in Episcopal churches, there was right one and right two. Right one was also was, was more like the Anglican standard text. And it was used for penitential seasons. And right two was more like the renewed ancient text. And it was used for the, for the festive seasons. The problem was one was in Elizabethan English and one was in modern English. We don't have that problem now. We're, they're both, they're both um, kind of uh, are, even if some of the words aren't real normal for people, it's not Elizabethan English. So that's one of the difference. Okay, second question. What's the shape of the service uh, of the table? Um, and for those of you who have mentioned uh, or uh, have read anything Dom Gregory Dix, he is the one who, who has pointed out what is the shape of the service, the second, the, the, the Holy Communion part. What, he, he uses four words. Does anybody know him? What the shape is? Um, I just heard them recently, but I can't remember. <laughs> okay. It's good to remember them because this, this, it, there are there are people who disagree now, and there is more scholarship. But this really shaped liturgical scholarship for two generations in the shape of the service of the table, and, and so it involves um, Jesus took the bread. The first action is to take. He blessed, um, or he gave thanks is probably better. He gave thanks. He broke the bread, and he gave it. So it's. It's took, blessed, broke, and gave. Um, now, now, you can see those actions turn in, in your prayer book. Let's look at the renewed ancient text. It's, it, I pretty much want to stick with that today because I know that that's the one people use more. L look at the uh, page 131, okay? So what Dom Gregory Dix did is he said, when you look across... Um, 1900 years of liturgical history, um, you see these four actions in, in the service of the table. So the first action he took, and that's the offertory. Okay, so, so the offertory is not the end of the service of the word. It's the beginning of the service of the table. It's the beginning of the Holy Communion, because that's that's where we take. And if you're on page 131 now, um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the uh, sentences of scripture in a few minutes. The celebrant may begin the offertory with one of the provided sentences of scripture. During the offertory, a hymn, psalm, or anthem may be sung. So that hymn, psalm, or anthem is part of the offertory. The deacon or priest prepares the holy table for celebration. We'll talk about that in a minute. Representatives of the congregation may bring the people's offerings of bread and wine, money or other gifts to the deacon or priest. And that's the taking, the, the, the bringing forward of the bread and the wine uh, to, to be um, consecrated for the Holy Communion. By the way, um, just 
just a little detail for you to be aware of. Um, don't, don't ever use grape juice in place of wine. Um, the, I, we, we have, we've had churches doing that in the past. I don't know if any do, and I wouldn't surprise me if we still do, but, but Anglican practices bread and wine. If you have people who have scruples about alcohol, um, there is non-alcoholic al uh, wine, one, and or um, one of the things we believe is you receive communion in one, one kind, you've received it in both kinds. So um, plenty of people I know who struggle with alcohol simply receive the bread. And that is acceptable in Anglican practice. This, by the way, is why it's difficult sometimes to be in a... Um, evangelical ecumenical setting where they want you to do communion with them and you say well uh, are you guys good with wine oh no we use grape juice and i would stay away from those <laughs> just uh, you know if you want to partake that's one thing but i mean actually leading in in, in those kinds of, of settings where we don't use wine kind of thing um the other thing is there could be other gifts besides money um at, at the offertory. Um, I would argue that uh, any hymn, psalm, or anthem sung is also an offering. And if you have a, a music group in your church, whether it's a traditional choir or a soloist or a praise band, um, if, you, if, if they do a special number, or if you have the congregation, it, it needs to be an offering to the Lord. Um, and it needs to be seen. We talked a little, I think, last time about music. Um, this, is, um, this is what music at this point is. It is an offering to the Lord. Um, it, in, a, in a sense, that prepares us for communion, but it doesn't need to be a communion preparation piece. Praise is an offering to the Lord. So, so un understand that the same <clears throat> offering to the Lord doesn't suddenly make it one kind of music but that's what it's not it's it's not an offering of of the the soloist new cd um we talked about this is i i i believe in doing things well but this is an offering to the lord not not a chance to show off talent kind of thing um and um that would also influence if you used a hymn um my this would influence my uh, how I would pick a hymn. Um, it's hard to offer something that nobody in the congregation knows. So don't put a new hymn in here that nobody's ever sung. Or, or don't put something in here that you want the congregation to sing that only people with a, with a voice range of three octaves can sing. Um, again, I, you know, I, have, I have a lot of stuff about music that comes out, as you can see, but, but offering up to the Lord needs to be an offering that people can praise the Lord. It's, it's given over to the Lord uh, at this point. And this is the first part of, of the action of, of, uh, of the communion service, of the service of the table to, to take. But the second is uh, he gave thanks or he blessed. Uh, I think most people would say he, he gave thanks. That's why it's the great thanksgiving um, uh, that you, you have the offertory and, and then, then the great thanksgiving prayer, which is, you know, the, the, the sursum corda, um, lift up your hearts, the, uh, the, uh, the sanctus, the, the prayer of conse consecration. It is, it is literally a prayer of thanksgiving um, that that the priest is leading for the congregation. Um, my my father-in-law um, was a pastor in the Reformed Church and, and a wonderful pastor and a wonderful man, but he was notorious at family gatherings for offering a grace before meals that would go on about 10 or 15 minutes um, in which he would lay out the whole plan of God's salvation just in case somebody needed to hear it now we make fun of that but that's what this is <laughs> we we get to do it every sunday where this is this is a table grace a table thanksgiving in which we lay out the whole plan of salvation 
And, and when you think of it that way, um, it takes on a different, a, a different uh, tone to it. Um, the, the Holy Communion, the service of the table is our Christian meal together. Um, just as the, the Seder meal is, is the Jewish meal the, of, of significance of, of um, you could say the sacramental meal. I know that's kind of anachronism calling Passover a sacrament, but it is an Old Testament sacrament. Um, and and we, we, after, after taking the bread and the wine and placing them on the altar and, and the gifts of the people and the musical offerings, then we give thanks as we would at the beginning of a meal, particularly if we had a large gathering or a church supper or a family meal. So, so that's the giving thanks. He broke. Okay, that's the third, uh, the third point. Now, in, in older Anglican practice, the breaking of the bread was, was often done at the words of institution. A and it was done there because in the 1662 prayer book, your, your prayer of thanksgiving ends with the words of institution. So, so when do you break it? Well, uh, um, you know, on, on the night he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it. <laughs> break. Mm -hmm. And that's why if you see on page 133, there's a little asterisk and, and the asterisk indicates that you can, you may, uh, according to traditional practices, Anglicans, you may break the bread there. Um, what John, uh, what uh, Dom Gregory Dix did for us is to say, well, the breaking comes at the end of the prayer of Thanksgiving. And where does our prayer of our great Thanksgiving end? It, it ends with the doxology and, you know, and, the, and the great amen there. So that's why um, current practice, uh, again, either is acceptable, but but clearly the preferred practice for us is to break the bread after the great amen and, and not in the words of the institution. Uh, because he took, he gave thanks, and then he broke. Okay, you, you can see this is, this is the logic uh, of it. And um, uh, I'm, I'm just reading off some notes. A friend of mine, he did a little talk on that. Um, he, he said, it, when, when we break the bread, it is a, the incarnational act of the Eucharist. It's real bread and real wine. You know, we, we don't do air communion. Um, it, it, is, um, it is the communal nature of the, of the Holy Eucharist. I think um, normative practice for Anglicans is one cup on the altar not multiple cups. So one cup um, in which you consecrate. And if you have a large congregation, you have, you have additional chalices on the side, which you fill from a flagon, which is on the altar. So if you're gonna to need to bless a lot of wine, one chalice and a flagon on, on the corporal. And we'll talk about what a corporal is if you don't know what it is already. Um, in a minute. So, um, I, I, if we were if we were truly consistent, we would extend it to one loaf, one loaf, one chalice. Um, my guess is all of us in our churches use the the little prepared hosts um, rather than a, a nice loaf of bread. And, and there are practical reasons, particularly during COVID, especially. <laughs> um, for that, but but one of the things I would love to see is our churches move towards one loaf. Um, you know, you, you have that in the, in the Didache. You know, as as the grain of the fields is scattered on the hills and then brought together in one loaf, so we, you know, being being scattered as people are brought together and we partake of the one loaf. It's a powerful symbol. Um, one one cup and and one loaf. So it's incarnational. It's communal. And um, 
it is a historical act. I mean, it does recall the Lord's Last Supper. It, it's not it's not just a, a mythological, it, it is myth in the sense that there is a deeper, bigger meaning that it communicates. The 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 myth, the sense that that C.S. Lewis and other gives of, of myth. That there's there's there are mythological myths and there are real myths. <laughs> and he would call this a real myth because it's a story that really happened. Jesus did take the bread and he did take the cup. There's a time and a place in history, but but it has resonance throughout all of creation and, and so much more. And that's the mythological character of it. The story is bigger than just the, the historical nature, but it is historical. Mm -hmm. And then he gave. Um, um, so so he he so we we take the bread and the wine to the table we give thanks for it we break the the bread um and uh then we distribute it then we give to the people and that's the shape of of the service of the table okay so third question a uh, question question yeah go ahead. when you're going to give uh uh canon david when you went front of the altar at that point would you say uh routinely this is for baptized people yes that, yes yeah. um okay let's talk about fencing the altar good 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 question um cooper cooper i looks like he's that's a good reform term fencing the altar it's it's um it, it can take a draconian turn to it and i don't want to do that but but given given <clears throat> the understanding or lack thereof in our common society and given the fact that that what what churches used to call open communion which is um we will we will give communion to people from any other christian church now open communion means we will give communion to anybody no matter what their spiritual state is including their dog. And if you think I'm making that up, um, that I have seen articles about priests communing uh, pets. And, and I was actually once asked if I would communicate, I would give communion to a cat. Um, uh, no, I'm sorry, if I would baptize a cat, same thing, really. <laughs> um, um, so, so without, so without being um, unnecessarily harsh, um, I think it is important both verbally and if, um, if you have a, a printed something or if you have a screen to, to just make a, a very gracious statement um, about um, you're invited to receive Holy Communion if you've been baptized with water Notice I said with water, I, th I think that's important, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Mormons are baptized, by the way. So why wouldn't you commune a, commune a Mormon? They've been baptized with water. And they're being, it's not in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's not in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, when I was still a uh, congregational pastor, United Church of Christ, they put out... Um, they were doing kind of their own version of a prayer book, which is comical because of course, that was one of the things that the Puritans hated about um, uh, Anglican uh, in the Anglican that they used a prayer book. And so Puritans didn't want a prayer book. But anyway, the UCC many years later put out a, a, a uh, and they had kind of a trial version and uh, I got it um, because I was not yet an Anglican and I wanted to, to use a more liturgical form. Um, and I noticed the baptismal service, you had, you had two options. You could baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or you could baptize in the name of God, Creator, Redeemer, and Sanctifier. Mm -hmm. And I took out my white out and whited that out. And I was doing a baptism um, in when I was traveling for a church in Seattle, and the uh, the, the uh, pastor there saw it, and he said, I, "I see you don't like that." And I said, "No, it's heretical. <laughs> it's modalism, kind of thing." So anyway, um, I, I think we we need to emphasize that people 
if we if we commune any Christian that it's it's you've been baptized with water in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I've got an article somewhere. Um, I think it's by um, it's by one of our Anglican writers uh, in ACNA. It's very good, and he, and he talks about how to do that in a gracious way that people not only understand who aren't baptized, but actually is a way to begin to get in conversation with them uh, about the gospel. And, uh, and so it's one to think through. Yes, I, I, I would say that. And uh, again, only the Lord knows. You know, we, we're, we're not there. Um, this is not Puritan New England where you have to stand before the diaconal board and give your testimony and show, show, show the fruit of regeneration before you receive communion. That was Jonathan Edwards. Uh, that the the whole thing, but but we do we do want to have um, have an understanding that that's who communion is for, absolutely, yeah. Even even with spiritual communion, even with spiritual communion, yeah. No. Yeah. Okay, so question three, and we've got a couple minutes before break, and then I'm going to get into this. Then we will get into some of the weeds. Um, why is the Eucharist called a sacrifice in patristic writings? Um, so I, I made a big deal at the beginning about uh, the uh, Anglican standard text being very careful that we understood that we are not sacrificing Christ. But when you when you read the fathers, it's very common to refer to the to the Eucharist as a sacrifice. What it, what is sacrificial about it? Where, what is the sacrifice going on here? The, the, the clues are in the text. Well, we say it's a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Okay, so, so that, is, that is one of the sacrifices. Um, and, and that is not to diminish its sacrificial intent. That's actually to invest praise and thanksgiving with, with a huge new meaning. This is, a, this is the sacrifice that God wants, is our praise. And that's certainly in the Psalms, you know, uh, um, where, where um, the excessive ritualism, you know, don't, don't bring me your sacrifices if, um, if there's other things that are a problem there. So praise and thanksgiving, what else? Because it is a sacrifice, <laughs> in spite of what what people will say, it is it is sacrificial in nature. But it is our praise and and uh, thanksgiving. Okay, it is the sacrifice of ourselves. So who's who's being sacrificed here is we are giving ourselves sacrificially back to the Lord. Okay, so we're not being sacrificed for sins. We wanna be very clear that, that Christ has been sacrificed once and for all on the cross. That is full, sufficient um, oblation, uh, uh, a gift, a sacrifice for us. But, but in the Eucharistic service, we are presenting ourselves as living sacrifices to the Lord for his service. So there is that sense um, too. So there's a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. There is sacrificial giving um, in, in the offertory. It, it says, you know, money and other gifts. When we give that scene in the context of it. And, and it is, and I, and I wanna I wanna walk on this very carefully, tread on this. It, it is a joining in of Christ's sacrifice once and for all on the cross. Um, but it is in the sense of, of remembering, of, of, the, of the idea of the, of the Passover meal in which you're not just remembering cognitively, you, you are bringing past and present together. And, and so um, no, knowing the theology of, of, of the Passover meal, that, that you're back in Egypt again and, and you're being set free or you can turn it around. Um, 
Egypt has come to you now. And, and so it is a entering into again, what, what has happened in the past to make it present. And, um, and certainly if we want the other direction to bring the future into the present. Um, mm. And so there is that, that sense too, but, but that's the sense in which it's, it's, it's sacrificial. Uh, praise and thanksgivings, our, our sacrificial giving, whatever form that takes, the giving of ourselves, the self-donation of our se- donation of ourselves, and entering into um, through the sacrament the the past made present in in uh, in this again, and that makes it a I, I think a powerful thing too. Okay, last question, an Anglican question. You get asked this particularly by people coming in. How is Christ present in the Eucharist? How, where (laughs) is Christ, you might say? Okay, what is, again, look at the text. What does the text tell us how Christ is present? In these holy mysteries. Okay, so what would that imply? Uh, Well, um, well, let's look at it. that he may dwell in us and we dwell in him. Um, so it's obviously we say real presence. We believe in real presence. Um, what that means, there's a mystery, but uh, there's no doubt he is present to what that looks like. Um, uh, is uh, is open. I guess that's that maybe, again, I'm just speaking out loud. Uh, yeah. It's that via media you know it's not calvin where it's just spiritual it's not necessarily or it can be but or depending on who you ask maybe or luther with khan or further even if you go that to the other side of the spectrum well that's too much maybe you know again it depends on the anglo-catholic nature of the 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 priest the, the parish the theology there maybe the diocese the bishop um, it's a white tent. So in these holy mysteries seems like a reverent, honest, you're not, not saying anything. Um, you're leaving it there. And I like that. It's kind of an Eastern thought of awe of mystery. Yeah. Maybe that's from patristics and we've adopted that from Eastern theology as we have with John Chrysostom, the prayer of Thanksgiving at the end. Um, so just rambling at this point. Well, I think your point about um, adopting a more Eastern uh, position is right on. And and we know that the the, uh, English reformers um, certainly had some affinity for that uh, because again, they they went to the fathers and the the fathers talk about this um, in in, uh, those kinds of terms. Um, So Cooper, you're at Westminster Seminary would a good reformed theologian believe in real presence in, in the Eucharist? Yes, they would say real presence, but what we mean by that, it would be different. And what would you, what would it mean when, when a reformed theologian says real presence? This is important. <laughs> yeah, uh, truly spiritually present. So not corporally or in flesh at, in the elements, but truly in heaven we spiritually receive Christ at the table. And, and how is, how is, where, where would you locate the spiritual presence of Christ from a standpoint in, in the Eucharist? Would it be in the wine or would it be where? In heaven. In heaven. How about in the gathered community? So okay. Calvin, Calvin believes in real presence. Right. So that's why real presence is, is a slippery term. And the mm-hmm. uh, real presence where? <laughs> um, because because mm-hmm. a, a good Calvinist believes in real presence, but but that real presence is not, you, you need the bread and the wine, but the real presence is in, in the gathered community. It's mm-hmm. in, and that's why it's a spiritual presence because but it's not incorporeal in that you can see your brothers and sisters. Um, so there are some analogies. You, 
if you believe in real presence in the bread and the wine, you can't see Jesus either, you see, but, but it does rely on the senses. And, and, and Calvin talks about the senses um, there. Mm -hmm. So, so what I think what I want to hold out to you is that um, I'll go back to the metaphor I used in the, the first talk. Um, it's, it's like the goalposts in, in football, okay? Um, Anglicans believe in real presence. So we're not simply a memorial meal. Mm -hmm. um, to be, to be, and I'm not even sure that this is fair to Zwingli, but to be mm -hmm. a Zwingli and the, you know, Lord save me from my disciples, um, that, that, that it is more than a, just a memory. We're not just getting together like the 4th of July to remember 1776 when, you know, um, or the Declaration of Independence. Um, it is more than that. Um, Jesus is really present. But the goalposts indicate that we can understand that presence uh, kind of in different ways. And that while we may disagree with our Christian brothers, um, we do hold a real presence. Uh, I would say, um, the vast majority of Anglicans that I know uh, would be would believe in a real but spiritual presence in the bread and the wine. Okay, so we wouldn't diminish the gathered community, but we would say kind of the the focus of Christ's presence is in the bread and wine, which is why we consume it, and then and and then you could see it consumed in the gathered community. Mm -hmm. um, on on so one side says uh, we're not Zwingli, Zwinglians. Where the other goalpost is, I think, is is still un, under debate. We we have we have uh, Anglicans worldwide, our high church wing, who um, who are are very Catholic in their theology of real presence. Um, they would believe in transubstantiation. And things. Right. Others would argue that's outside the bonds of Anglicanism. Um, uh, I think. But, but however, and this is the mystery aspect. However, however we want to define real presence, um, that that is that is an Anglican belief. And what what makes us different from Roman Catholics is we say, and we won't tell you how that has to happen. Mm -hmm. So we'll give you some range in believing how that happens. Mm -hmm. um, so, so probably the last thing, and then we'll take take about a five minute break. Probably the last thing to say then is what we believe about Holy Communion can be seen in what we do at the end of Communion with leftover bread and wine. Mm. Okay, so if you believe that that it, the bread and the wine are simply symbols, but there is no real presence, what would you do with them after communion if there's stuff left over? Toss them. Toss them. Yeah, but if you believe that that they that Christ was present, but after the communion service is over nothing's happened to them what do you do with them you consume oh it's it it's ambiguous isn't it? they've been it's like what do you do what do you do with the manger after jesus leaves it <laughs> you know um you you might you might keep it around for veneration purposes you might not you know you might need the wood or whatever it was to start a fire it's ambiguous if you believe that that something has happened in the bread and the wine, even if you can't understand it, then what do you do with it? You, you either consume it um, reverently or you reserve it. And so, so the vast majority of our churches reserve the sacrament after it's been consecrated. So whatever we say we believe, we believe that the bread and that wine has taken on some kind of significance that it did not have before. And 
And when we take the reserve sacrament out to the sick and shut-ins, we don't reconsecrate it. So, so we're saying in our, in our Eucharistic theology, something has happened to the bread and the wine and it still conveys Christ's presence. It doesn't just, it's not just bread anymore. We're, we're not going to get picky on how we define it, but we handle it carefully and reverently. So think about that. Um, that's, you know, it's kind of an anthropological analysis, but what we, what we do with the thing, in spite of what we say we're doing, what, what we actually do conveys a meaning probably that's deeper than, than our theology. And, and I would argue that that is our theology. Um, I interviewed once um, John Christchurch Hamilton, um, interviewed there to be rector. They did not reserve the sacrament there. And I went, whoa, now, you know, uh, I, I don't know what he did under Jürgen because Jürgen was an Anglo-Catholic, but um, that was before Jürgen. So anyway, okay, take about a five minute break and then talk about all the nine little bricks. Each of us could be a, a lecture at the end. So see you in five.